Rolling Stone, Forbes, NME, Pitchfork. Outlets old and new with critics reviewing big music. Some of the biggest albums in history, however, were initially hated by critics upon release. This video looks at 10 albums critics hated. I'm gonna be pulling reviews and quotes from well-known names like Rolling Stone and Pitchfork, but also outlets that no longer exist like Melody Maker. The time thing, however, is that these are well-established magazines, editorials, and websites who all said the following albums were not good. Just keep in mind this is not a ranked video. There's no ranking of critics hated this one the most and this one not as much on a list like this. You know how these videos work, let's get to it. Starting off with a big one, go back in time over 50 years to 1970 and Black Sabbath released a genre-defining self-titled album that would inspire thousands of future bands. And according to many outlets and critics in 1970, it was average at best and awful at worst. Black Sabbath was rejected by Rolling Stone's Lester Bangs, calling the album a cream ripoff, saying just like cream, but worse, as well as having inane lyrics and discordant jams. The Village Voice back in the day was harsher, calling Black Sabbath bull and the worst of the counterculture. On surface, the rock critics at the time turned up their nose in defiance at the overly loud and chaotic sounding music. Black Sabbath, however, would become the crowning gem of a counterculture, while Ozzy Osbourne became the voice and face of a metal generation in the 70s, inane lyrics and all. I understand how Black Sabbath must have been a shock to the system after so many other rock bands were enormous names in 1970 and the Beatles were over, and then in comes Ozzy and Tony going insane and making everyone think they were summoning the devil. The Prince of Darkness's unique voice coming after so many successful rock bands in a monumental time of music probably was another reason why critics dismissed the group along with the whole metal is evil ideology that Black Sabbath really ran with. A classic album, metal legends, and according to someone at Rolling Stone, a cream ripoff. Going to another classic album, critics hated ACDC and their international debut in 1976. It's another case of a new band with a unique vocalist and different music style that would eventually become a household name. But when critics first heard the voice of Bon Scott on high voltage and rock and roll anthems, it did not go over well. The most vicious comments came from Rolling Stone saying, those concerned with the future of hard rock may take solace in knowing that with the release of the first US album by these Australian gross out champions, the genre has hit an all time low. Stupidity bothers me, calculated stupidity offends me. With mixed reviews across the board, the Aussies would eventually do just fine selling millions of copies of just about everything they've ever done. Rock and roll thrived out of Australia for decades, and whatever gross stupidity was warned about by Rolling Stone and Spin definitely was not an issue for rock and roll fans, with everyone in the world trying to air guitar whenever hearing Angus Young. ACDC never meant to be classical opera with a three-part narrative and 50 instrument composition. It's the classic format meant to rile you up and get you to sing along and hopefully not break any furniture. It's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll, and ACDC made sure they got there, regardless of anyone who was offended by them at the time. Really offended by ACDC? Come on. Fast forward to the 90s and the grunge revolution. Pearl Jam became one of the biggest bands in the world and had one of the best debut albums of all time with 10. Instant classics with several enormous singles that helped define a genre and the soundtrack of the early 90s, and not everyone was on board. Upon release, 10 had mixed reviews with NME saying that Pearl Jam were trying to steal money from young alternative kids' pockets. Pretty much saying Pearl Jam were pandering to an audience and trying to manipulate youth out of their parents' cash. Along with that, Entertainment Weekly referred to the album as a carbon copy of works by other emerging emerging grunge bands. The similar sounding bands argument isn't new and has been applied to many other bands and albums upon debuts for decades. So it happening to Pearl Jam is not crazy, but I'm not so sure about the accusation of Pearl Jam trying to capitalize on a trend or trick youth out of their money. Considering how Pearl Jam became a phenomenon and 10 would become a massive success, they technically took money out of everyone's pockets, however, and everyone willingly handed it over. 10 is beloved now across the board, and it's a staple of alternative and grunge lore, which still gets radio play today with the singles. Not bad for a band originally labeled as Watered Down Nirvana. Back in the late 70s, Queen could do no wrong for most people and earn their reputation as being one of the best bands in the world, except for a few critics who were not a fan of the 1978 album Jazz. With the popularity of Queen at the time and Freddie Mercury not caring who he offended with his behavior or attitude or just existence, Jazz did not go over well with everyone upon release. Rolling Stone in 1979 said that Jazz featured Queen as elitist, treating women like objects, and the first truly fascist rock band. The whole thing makes me wonder why anyone would indulge in these creeps and their polluting ideas. Not kind praise to the album or Queen. Cream also gave a rough review saying that jazz was absurdly dull and filled with dumb ideas and imitative posturing. As time went on, jazz would be much more highlighted as a Queen album in their most lighthearted era of music and Rolling Stone would later retract 
respect the original review and revere jazz as a classic. Rolling Stone went from having Queen as an elitist, objectifying band to full praise of an album filled with some of the most recognizable Queen songs. All four members of Queen contributed to writing songs on jazz, and all four members of Queen did not care what critics thought. I understand this is not a deeply serious album, but the quality of Queen and music writing is still there. Also, is anyone else surprised that there hasn't been some type of Fat Bottom Girls TikTok dance yet? I mean, there are TikTok dances for the wildest songs now, like Parappa the Rappa music. So, yeah. I feel like eventually we're gonna see something with Queen. In the mid 90s, Oasis were on top of the world. No matter how big they were in the US, it was nothing compared to the height of fame in the UK. And it's due to the enormous success of the band's first two albums. The band's second album, What's the Story, Morning Glory, however, was not initially seen as the strong follow up to Oasis' debut, Definitely Maybe. What's the Story, Morning Glory received mixed reviews upon release, with Q, Chicago Tribune, and Spin Magazine all labeling the sophomore release as a failure, but none so critical as Melody Maker saying, What's the story sounds labored and lazy. On this evidence, Oasis are a limited band. They sound knackered. Some of those reviews became instantly dated as the album would become so massively successful that it set generation lasting records for highest selling album in the UK and sold huge in the US as well as around the world. Then after Wonderwall became a 90s classic for people, some of those critics politely changed their tone. The backlash on Oasis' second album was oddly fast, and many outlets were quick to call them a fluke. But Oasis proved them wrong with their second album. Oasis was a phenomenon in the UK and also huge in the US. And this album, Champagne Supernova, Wonderwall, all of that, it proved that these critics had nothing to talk about. Until later, Oasis albums like Be Here Now, and then I guess I could have understood the critics a little bit more. One album that I loved when it was released, but I do understand why critics at the time were confused with, is I Get Wet by party hero Andrew W.K. Back in a year when new metal, post grunge, and pop punk were all dominating in rock, Andrew W.K. brought out a spin on true rock and roll and proclaimed his love for partying that would last through the ages. That did not go over well with everyone. Many critics in 2002 blasted the album, but none so worse than Pitchfork, with two Two statements in a long Pitchfork-esque review. This here is about as empty as rock music gets, right down to the tinny, digitally produced tone bank noise that passes for guitars. The article would then close out with the reviewer and founder of Pitchfork, Ryan Schreiber, saying, So then, what is the excuse for a typically elitist music nerd to bow to Andrew WK's blistering tard rock? That's right, folks. There isn't one. First of all, go screw yourself, Pitchfork, and your desperate for attention edgelord writing. Second, Pitchfork would then redact their review and glow praise I get wet 10 years later in 2012. Almost as if to say, we're sorry for several pages in text. Pitchfork thrives on sounding like geniuses in their writing through snark, but putting that aside, Andrew WK would eventually be praised for being an oddly wholesome musician and figure in rock and roll, due in large part to I Get Wet. Loud party anthems were meant to have fun with, not meant to be brilliant prog albums or something like that in the genre and meant to really blow your mind. It's just fun music. Also, go screw yourself, Schreiber and Pitchfork. The sophomore album from Weezer, which is beloved by the masses now, was actually seen as a bit of a flop in the 90s, as a follow-up and not worth paying attention to according to many critics. After the success of the Blue Album, Rivers Cuomo and company set out to expand their sound and build on a foundation they set in a unique time of music when the alternative scene of the 90s was booming. Pinkerton was that album, and the initial results were condemning a sophomore slump. One review from Entertainment Weekly back in 1996 read, Pinkerton sounds like a collection of get-down party anthems for a Agoraphobics, a sustained aria of disengagement. Another review from Melody Maker said to ignore the lyrics entirely. While looking at later Weezer albums, ignore the lyrics entirely is a comment that does hold water. I don't think it does for Pinkerton though, and the fan base from both diehard Weezer fans and casual listeners came around hard for the album after 1996. Also, Rolling Stone describing something as juvenile and aimless. Because if anyone knows Aimless, it's Rolling Stone. I think Pinkerton is great and got a bad rap after the Blue Album just because, in the mid-90s, many people wanted Blue Album 2. Pinkerton was from a smart mind trying to make something more introspective. It was criticized hard, and as a result, Rivers went back to school and worked harder on making more upbeat pop rock songs, which would become the norm for Weezer. Kind of a shame, because... Yeah. 
I kind of like Pinkerton style more. Another sophomore album that some critics hated at first was Sam's Town, the follow-up to the killer smash Hot Fuss. This album was not beloved across the board, as it was a much deeper written and introspective album, both in lyric and in sound. Naturally, critics got all grumpy about that. The New York Times referred to Sam's Town as painful, and added that the killers are a talented band that evolved way too fast for the wrong reasons. Following that, Rolling Stone said the killers ditch their cheerfully fake Bowie moves and try to get heavy by copying Bruce Springsteen. No, it's not a good move. Sandstown would go from having a cult following to universal praise, even earning Rolling Stone's fan-voted award of most underrated album of the decade in 2009. Other outlets would be much kinder over time as well, giving credit to the killers for making something different from their debut at a time when everyone was still living for the sound of Hot Fuss. Along with that, the killers' success would only continue on strongly overseas to the point of British and other European music fans thinking the killers were UK-born. Nope. They're from Vegas. Calling the killers fake David Bowie music and then turning around to call their follow-up fake Bruce Springsteen music. I feel like someone at Rolling Stone was really trying hard to put down the killers any means necessary. Album is now cherished by the Killers fans and went platinum in many countries including the US and UK, so it turns out it was a good move after all for them to do this. When Radiohead decided to go headfirst into experimental territory with electronic and ambient styles and less traditional rock, Kid A was met with much praise around the world and cherished by music lovers still to this day. That word cherished does not apply to some of the outlets who did not understand what in the world Radiohead was doing back in the year 2000. The New Yorker said Kid A was morbid proof that this sort of self-indulgence results in a weird kind of anonymity rather than something distinctive and original. Even more savage was Melody Maker saying Kid A was tubby, ostentatious, self-congratulatory, look ma, I can suck my own <laughs> whiny old rubbish. About 60 songs were started that no one had a bloody clue how to finish. Keep in mind, some retractions were made, and now Kid A is much more praise in retrospect, along with much of Radiohead's discography. Kid A would go on to be certified platinum in the UK and US. Melody Maker closed its doors in the year 2000, the same year this album and review came out. Give credit to Radiohead also trying something wildly new in 2000, when new metal and post grunts were the big styles dominating every rock fan's attention. Radiohead pushed on and kept standing out in positive ways in a sea of nookies and with arms wide opens. That's commendable. Even if some people think it's tubby and ostentatious and wow, that Melody Maker guy was just crazy. Finally, this one was a surprise to me as years after Wish You Were Here came out, it would be revered, but upon initial release, it was seen as quite the letdown and uninspiring to critics. Not only that, but Rolling Stone's critique said, passion is everything of which Pink Floyd is devoid. In referring to that follow-up to Dark Side of the Moon. Number one, I do literally facepalm every time after reading that. Number two, this is shocking because not only was Wish You Were Here an extremely emotional and cathartic album, Album during a rough time for Pink Floyd, it's filled with creative and unique songwriting that was not the norm back in the mid-70s. Melody Maker back in the day also said that the album displays a critical lack of imagination in all departments. It's crazy how one of the two major themes of Wish You Were Here is targeted directly at the music industry at the time, and when the album was released, some of the big names working with the music industry gave reviews calling it passionless and lacking imagination. I honestly feel if any professional review from a major outlet aged instantly and reflected bad on their reviewer, this is probably it. It's hard to put bias aside on this album because this is one of my all-time favorite albums, and Pink Floyd really was spot on about the music industry back in the day, and their view of it still holds up several decades later. What I don't get is that Pink Floyd were public with their issues and attitudes at the time, so either music media hated Pink Floyd as much as Pink Floyd hated the music industry, or someone listened to the wrong album. There's no other way. Know of another album the critics hated, or at least at first? Leave a comment and let everyone know. Big thanks to my patrons and a special thanks to Brandon Berenfeld, Chris Doman, and Dom Smith. You can have a say in upcoming videos and see videos early by supporting Rocked on Patreon. Please click on the link in the video description for more information on helping the channel. Please subscribe and ring the bell to get notified of upcoming videos, and you can keep up to date with Rocked on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you guys again for watching. Just so you know, the last few longer list videos I've done on this channel have all been suggestions from fans and followers. Hey, I actually listen sometimes. I'm gonna be doing another Album Drops video again, covering some of the bigger albums that were released this month. All voted on by my patrons, and then I'll be working on a video about songs that everyone gets the meaning of wrong. Let me know in the comments if you have any suggestions. Again, thanks for watching. Hope to see you next time.